Great relationships don't just happen. They're designed. Why leave love to chance when you can make strategic decisions in your relationship just like you do in your career? The days of settling for mediocre are over. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Join us as we explore the decisions and choices that make relationships work no matter what life throws your way. It's time to reimagine relationships from the ground up. Welcome to Project Relationship. Hi, and welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. We're going to talk about regulations today. Wait, that, regulations. Doesn't, that does not sound fun or sexy. <laughs> Rules and or regulations. Wait. No. We're going to talk about self regulation and co regulation. So, really, we're going to talk about how to feel better in your real life that's complicated and has ups and downs. But the ability to self regulate and to co regulate can be a, a huge benefit to. All humans. And I just want to toss something out right now. I didn't used to know this was possible. Sure. I remember you. You were um, unregulated. Unregulated. <laughs> That's a good word for it. Yeah. And unregulated so... Ken Hamilton. I remember that guy. He was kind of a jerk. Yeah. Why? He had a... What does oh. re- what does self-regulation mean to you now? What do you know about it now? Um, uh, it helps me get a feeling of stability and safety. And when I don't feel safe, I'm a jerk. And you didn't feel safe an awful lot of the time. Yeah. Me either. So I'll totally, I will absolutely jump on that boat. This is a concept that I think some people grow up in families where learning the skills of self-regulation are, it's, it's just part of be, growing up. Um, maybe you had parents who were just very competent regulators themselves, they were able to, let's just be clear, they were able to self-soothe, bring themselves back into um, a a state of being in their body that felt safe and collected. It's it's about being able to deal with the highs and lows of your your mood swings, your emotions, your your the body, um, your your body being um you know uh, what's the word for it? Um, escalate feeling all excited, excited, yeah. or feeling, you know, depressed, feeling like the physical symptoms of depression, feeling all of the highs and lows of life, being able to bring yourself back into some sort of balanced state. Some people's parents just come to that well they come to it sort of naturally and so they teach it to their children and they model it for their children and some people's parents are therapists or or teachers who know these skills or whatever they they learned it along the way and they found value in these skills and so they taught it i remember having a friend a close friend when i was growing up whose mother was a nurse and father was a speech pathologist and they spending time in their house um, if she had, if she experienced an upset or something went wrong, there were all of these ways that her parents responded to her that helped her calm herself down. And I knew something was different about that, but I couldn't put my finger on it. I didn't know what it was until I was at her house one time for a sleepover. I was probably 10 or 11 years old, not, not too old. But it wasn't my first sleepover or anything. And um, for whatever reason, I got spooked. I got scared at probably 11 o'clock at night. And so I went and knocked on her parents' bedroom door. And and they they opened the door and they were, and it was fine. They just, they moved into calming me, but not by doing much of anything. They calmed themselves. And I can re- still remember it because there was this calm demeanor. Their voice was so not what I was used to. Mm -hmm. My experience growing up was that if one member of the family was experiencing an emotional status of any kind, it was um, shared. Uh Spread around. It was spread around. Mm -hmm. And there was, there was a lot of group dynamic to that. We, we would all sort of 
it was like being on one of those um, those rides, the the rides that you get on at, at Six Flags or whatever. You're in that ship. It was like in our house. We were all on that ship sitting way at the end. Oh, and dear. so when everything swung or swang or whatever that is, it was wild. And you felt out of control. And it, I had this experience of being at my friend's house and her parents just just calmed me down and then they called my parents and and I did decide to go home that night but I remember getting home and thinking what the heck was that nobody was upset nobody got angry that I was disrupting anything nobody minded that I had a fear or that I was having feelings nobody there was there was just a response so your experience as a as a kid with with parents and other adults around and you could see that some and i think it's true of all of us some of us have skills in this way and some of us have less skill and and so here we are as adults getting together trying to figure out how to live our lives together um what what do you have to say to people like me who who came in with like uh, just just spreading stuff around. Well, I I when when you and I first started spending time together, I would say that we were pretty much at the same spot. Both of us would be just kicked around by our moods, by mm -hmm. the emotions that were in the house, and both of us were spreaders. Yeah, right. <laughs> we would we were, were whatever we? we felt, we would spread around. I'm sure our exes loved that. <laughs> Apologies, yeah. wherever you are, but anyways. <laughs> That's where we were. And what I say now is, um, while I think about what that what that feels like, that sense of of being kicked around, the best news I got was learning that there was a set of skills. And I had been to therapy several times and never had been introduced to the very clear skill sets that there are around down regulating overexcited states. And you don't mean several times with one therapist. No, you mean, I mean several, several therapists over times. years of trying different things. But I hadn't been introduced to the just the bare fact that some of this is about skills, about learning a set of skills. And more importantly for me anyways, and I think for you too, was that it's there are some decision making processes that happen yes. yep. early in in those excitation modes. So both you and I um, we would get into moods of either anger or sadness connected mm -hmm. to anger or sadness. Yep. And I think we both experienced them as sort of an emergency. Like if you were feeling anger or sadness, it was urgent. Yeah. Everything was about to go sideways somehow. And so it was time to panic. And you had helpful. to do anyway, something about it. You had to do something. Right. So I had the, I had the interesting experience of learning that some of what was going on was a choice because I was in a, I left my marriage and then I moved into your household and I was an adult, but I was living with other adults and I didn't want to look like a big baby child. <laughs> I just didn't. And so some of the ways that I had acted seemed really immature to me all of a sudden. So I just knocked that off. And I don't want to suggest that all things are just a decision. But looking back, I am shocked at how many of my reactive um, behaviors were, it's not that I needed more self-control. I just needed to know that I could decide to feel the feeling and sit with it myself. Yeah. I didn't actually need to spread it around. And the spreading it around was not, had not provided some sort of solace or support Right. I think that, I was doing it hoping that it would provide support. But when I realized that I could actually sit with my feelings in your house and not spread it all over everywhere and uh, the feeling would change. That was the amazing part for me cuz yeah, there's so there's a there was a point you helped me understand that there was a difference between how I was feeling and how I was behaving. Yeah. And that the way I behaved was a choice. And sometimes the feeling felt so strong that it didn't feel like a choice. It felt like it was coming right up out of me. But over time, as we matured together, 
and talked about things, I realized, no, actually, if I dig in, I can find the part of me that's actually deciding to act that way. Yeah. And that part could decide to do something else. And so we're going to talk in another episode about what it means to have these parts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Cause I, I, you know, come from a back background of Jungian psychology. So there's a very clear framework there for talking about these parts of ourselves. And that's important to me because when we, when we notice that we can make a different decision, often it's because we're coming into a relationship with a, a bigger sense of self, what yeah. I call a capital S self. I, cause, because it comes out of the, the tradition that I, I, I practice when I realized that I could talk to you about separating out the feeling from the decision to behave in a certain way. And here we're talking about, I think, is this self-regulation yeah. that we're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. So rather than letting myself just act in the habitual way that I had when these feelings come up, uh, work with it and see if there were other things that I could do that would be more successful for me out of the experience. Right. And so we were doing this. It was a little like, um, <laughs> it was a, a little like, like climbing a, like a, a really unstable ladder together. We yeah, <laughs> were like, yep. okay, uh, I'm getting a hold of some little, of these skills and you're getting a hold of yeah. some of these skills. And that's important to me because so you ha came from uh, a family where it was much more about repress your emotions, push them down yeah. and do not acknowledge them. And I came from a family unit where we expressed all of them, yeah. but sort of with, with no differentiation about intensity. It was just sort of all at a high level. Everything ran at this high level and anger was preferable to sadness. So it was, it was sort of an angry high level. There are a million ways for families to do this. There are, there are so many different ways. So I'm, I'm not suggesting that your families would have looked like this, but these are two distinctly different ways that in the end, we resolved them in a similar manner. Yes. By noticing that our feelings, our emotional responses to things and our, and our deeply felt, they really are deeply felt experiences that didn't need to be acted on at all. Yeah. We could just decide, but the trick was, and I remember this distinctly, um, learning to identify what was setting us off, either one of us, mm -hmm. the earlier you can identify it, the oh, easier yeah. it is to manage. Yep. So that was much harder for me. I, this will come as a shock to you. It was much easier for me to see what you were doing. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So, yep. yeah, it's not easy to be married to me. Um, I could well, see what you were doing. That's actually easy for me because you would see what was happening earlier, which would make it easier for. And I would I would say, hey, it. I see I, I see this. Are you feeling mm -hmm. this thing? And I would ask that question like. Earlier and earlier mm -hmm. in the process, I would be watching you. I was intently watching you. And of course I was, because I was I was in charge of everything in my childhood home. So I was always monitoring everyone's every interaction. So I was very used to being attuned to every subtle gesture and movement and facial expression. So I started noticing, just like I could with my children, a, ve a very early set of signals that you would give off that you were about to go down this road into behaving in ways that weren't in accordance with your values because you had a feeling. And this was an important part of, of this process because we're kind of moving out of self-regulation into co-regulation or getting well, close sort of. to, I mean, this, this was you helping you, me self-regulate. Right. I didn't know that that's what I was doing at the time, really. I started noticing that I could see what was going on and name it. Now, Here's the trick, though. I wasn't always right. No, you and weren't. And that was, that was hard because then I was imposing a lot of my own thoughts on what you were So that was something that I had to work out. But I think what was really important between the two of us in those situations is I had explicitly signed up for it. I had asked you to help me with this. You weren't coming to me and saying, 
stop doing things this way. I want you to do this. I had come to you and said, I would like help um, changing the way I present when I'm feeling angry or whatever. And so you were helping me not. And so for us, pushing it on me. this came about, um, the reason you asked me that is because we were running a business together. Yeah. And we were running this, we were running a CrossFit gym and you would come out on the floor for the four o'clock class. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Okay. So all wound up, oh. all wound up every single time oh. he would be late for class. So I always trained the four o'clock class. You took the four o'clock class. And so you would be late to class, which meant you should have had burpees every damn time. Uh -huh. You would always have picked a fight right before we worked out like five or six days a week. So this was pretty annoying. Was a lot of days. And you'd basically be just throwing a, a big old hissy fit. Yep. And then you'd come out onto the floor scowling and down and looking adorable in your little, you know, your little pink shorts and all. And that was great. But oh my gosh, the scowling and the, the dismal and so everything bad. was. And so we're talking about spreading it around, <laughs> right? It wasn't just us. And here's the thing. Yeah, I was, was able thing. to come to you and say, I think this needs addressing because I was able to put it off on, Hey, it's hurting our, it's hurting our business. Which, this isn't an appropriate way for us to be interacting on the floor. Which let me look at it from a professional point of view, which changed the way I entered into it. And Right. But, so that's, so that's how, how it went for us. Yeah. But I wanted to share this particular story because you did something really courageous, which was you gave me permission to say, I think, I think this is happening. I think you're having a feeling. I, and I think right now might be the time for you to check in. What's going on? What are you, what are you feeling? Name it. Talk to me about the, the feeling. And the, the more you were able to identify the actual emotional response you were having yeah. and name it and just, just say what was happening. The, the close, you know, you, you tightened up the window, the amount of right. time that you needed to spend in that uncomfortable place where you just wanted to, to, to spread lash everything out. out and lash mm -hmm. out at people. Um, it was a, when that window tightened up to, I mean, I think it started at about an hour, an hour, hour and 15 yeah. minutes. Yeah. And it got shorter and shorter and shorter as you learn to identify the sensations. Mm -hmm. So I was seeing on the outside little micro expressions and stuff but you are having sensations. And one of the micro expressions that I, I would point out to you is say, so your, your mouth is very tight right now. Are you feeling like your mouth is tight? And at first you would say no. And yeah. over time you were like, oh, it, it is, it is, it is tight. My throat is tight. My mouth is tight. I, I'm not, I don't feel comfortable. I don't feel safe. And, and I think actually that I don't feel safe was a long way in. Oh, it was that, that took a really long time. But you started naming the other sensations you were getting, and you were really good at putting names to those things. You would talk about, I don't know whether you remember all of this, but you would talk about feeling shaky and like you were buzzing inside. Yeah, like, right. Like you would, and then you'd get really specific. You would talk about how it felt like all the oxygen had left the, the top mm -hmm. of your lungs and you couldn't, and, or you'd feel like, um, like your blood had bubbles in it. You like, you had lots of very rich descriptions of what it felt like in you. That helped me immensely because I was not terribly connected to my body. Um, it, it was, it's been, it's been a lifelong process for me to come home to this body, um, which I love so much now, but woof you named those sensations and I started noticing, oh, I feel those sensations. I noticed those things. And the more we were able to name them, we then were able to learn what each of us needed. And they were a different set of things. And this is why yeah, right. I don't think what we were doing was co-regulation. I think we were co-discovering at this yeah, point. Yeah, I, I agree. We were experimenting with each other. Like, what the heck is going on? What's running the show? And just to be clear, we were, I was in my thirties. You were in your forties when this right. was happening. We were not yeah. children. We were, we were grown ass people. a little while ago. Yeah. It was not, wherever you are right now, it's not too late to start down this process. And if you're young, great, awesome. Get on it. <laughs> I didn't realize that even though I, I had, I considered myself self-aware and I mean, this is just a, 
The research bears out. Everyone thinks they're self-aware, but the research demonstrates that less than 15% of us are experiencing active self-awareness even part of the time. <laughs> so, so we all have a long way to go. We all have a long way to go. There's a lot of improvement to make around self-awareness, around being aware of what's actually happening. A lot of us. discoveries to make. Which is awesome because yeah, that is. means however good your life is right now, there's so much movement that can be made. Yep. So when we started naming the sensations, that let us close up the window. But we needed to do different things in order to self-soothe. Yes, the so things that soothed you weren't the same. Didn't look the same for us. They would for me, yeah. For one thing, I'm a talker. I know people listening to this podcast <laughs> would be shocked, shocked to find out that I'm a talker. So I wanted to process my, uh, my experience out loud. Um, and that didn't always work for you. So I needed to figure out what else to do because it's, I, I couldn't just use you like you were some bucket that I could pour my words at. Um, there are a lot of ways to self-soothe. What are some of the ones that work for you, work best for you? Self-soothing myself? Yeah. Um, well, um, especially to down regulate from that excited stage. Okay. Um, exercise does, does work. I mean, so from that excited stage, I feel energy and, and I actually physically releasing the energy helps. Um, so lots of different ways of moving my body. So I think that's interesting because so frequently people talk about doing breath work and breath works great and breath work works for me, but exercise is breath work. Yes. Yeah. Right. Like, so yeah. you start to, if you start to engage your body, especially in the way you do, you tend to do, um, uh, heavy rhythmic motions, things like that. They're, they're yeah. like complex lifts, um, gymnastic motions. There's a lot of breath control that goes into that. It's yeah, the, interesting the, to think about how that actually is an, an I have to control my breathing in a particular way to do the things. Yeah. So I have, there has to be some intention. Yeah. So, and so in that's order to keep thing. yourself safe, you also have to pay attention to what's actually going on. Yep. So you get into your body, into the moment. So exercise works for you. Yeah. How about you? Um, exercise does work for me if I am down regulated already, if I am like in a depressive mood and I need to upregulate, exercise works great for me. Mm -hmm. In particular, going for a run or doing something where I'm going to have to do a, a, a singular repetitive motion. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but when I'm highly agitated, that can actually, I, I go, I get into a spot where I really can't, and I know you've seen me get here. I can't, um, I can't safely move around mm -hmm. in a, in like a gym setting yeah. when I'm like that. And so for me, turning, turning toward my breath and slowing it down, but also saying stuff. I have to talk myself down. I really do. I have to out loud or in my head, talk myself down. I also use a bunch of tools, um, different, different, um, well, neurological tools, like different ways of, of engaging my body, um, like massaging my earlobes mm -hmm. and, and, um, rubbing my forehead in a very particular pattern, like some ways that I've learned to soothe my actual, um, muscles and the connective tissue and oh so is th are things like putting your face in your hands and stuff like that is yeah. that a kind of a, a self-regulation absolutely you know what when i was in college mm -hmm. my uh fashion design professor um taught us all to sit when we were because we'd get so overwhelmed before exams because exams when you're trying to like make something it's very it's really stressful. It's like mm -hmm. being on Project Runway. It's scary. Yeah. And um, so she taught us to, um, she called it palming your eyes on and just put like the heel of your, of your hands in your, like resting just on your covering, closed eyelids, covering up your with eye just with gentle pr pressure, just, just very, very gentle. And she would teach us to sit there at our desks and breathe slowly in what I now would think of as a box breath, like a four, four, four count of breath. Inhale, pause, exhale, pause. Yeah. yeah. For, she'd leave us there for like three minutes to just do that before we would need to, to 
And that was incredibly helpful for me. There are very small motions that I think most of us have cobbled together a little toolkit of these things, but making them conscious and writing them down so that I could teach them to other people, that's what made the difference. Okay. So what I would encourage anyone who's listening to do is to make a, make a short list for yourself of what you already do. Everyone listening is already self-regulating in some ways. And so noticing what you do, especially the ones that are a kindness to your body. So there are ways that we, um, that we cope that aren't healthy self-regulation. Like we, I mean, I've, I've used food as a coping mechanism, Mm -hmm. but that's not a way I want to treat my body and not, not for any sort of superficial reason, but because I have made myself tummy feel bad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot. I have, I have, um, experienced that most of my life. And so drinking a glass of water is another good one. I have to engage in the act of just slowly drinking a glass of water and being with my body. Um, having, talking myself down, having a set of affirmations to say. Oh, that's some good stuff. To remind myself of who I am at core. Um, Those are all moves that I think, I think most of us have a set of them. So yeah, make a list and get clear. And then let's just talk about co-regulation because I don't want to leave that off. Yeah. I think we'll do a whole other episode on it, but we could touch on it now. Let's talk about it. So one of the most basic skills of self-regulation is breathing, coming back to the breath. You don't have to have an elaborate breathwork practice. You don't need a, a degree in breath phys- breath physiology. I don't even know Maybe, what that would I be. Don't know. To, Pulmonology. to breathe, to right. bring intention to your yeah. breath. But um, a great skill of co-regulation. So this is, um, there's a great operationalization of um, co-regulation as a, uh, a bi-directional linkage of oscillating emotional channels, which are the subjective experience, expressive behavior, and autonomic physiology between partners, which contributes to emotional and physiological stability for both partners in a close relationship. So that is Butler and Randall from a 2012 paper on co-regulation. What I like about that definition is it's a reminder that co-regulation is is a it's a bi-directional process it moves between the two of us it's not about me caretaking for you or you caretaking for me in a top-down way it's about the two of us coming back into relation and participating together in an action of of self-regulation that moves uh, the way I actually envision it is it moves in like an infinity symbol, like Mm -hmm. a figure eight in between us. And we, we sync up again. And one of the basic skills of self-regulation breathing can also be used. If I am experiencing overexcitement and it's, it's too much. One of the best ways for me to calm myself, to downregulate, to is to sync up to your heartbeat. So I'll put my head against your your either your chest or your back and simply listen and slow my breath down. And so you, you, sometimes you're even just working and I'll come and I'll just put my my head there, and like calm myself through the the slow pace that your body is currently moving at because you're not feeling overexcited. So um, it's all very uh, body oriented. Very. I yeah. mean, the somatic experience, the experience of being in a body. So soma is the, the, the Greek for, for a living body, experiencing your body from the inside, being aware of that, of, of being an embodied creature is one of the like foundational pieces of knowing how to relate to you, who is also an embodied creature existing it helps me remember that we're not just we're not just brains and we're not just the words that we might be saying to each other we are these complex systems that are interacting and uh, yeah the complex systems that are interacting which what you just read that that bi-directional linking the that's the co-regulation part the co-part right 
um, the two of us together sharing our physical experience in a way that keeps us stable, as opposed to the way we started, where our shared physical experience would ramp each other up. Exactly. And so this isn't about either one of us taking responsibility for fixing anything, but about learning ways that we can collaborate on co-regulation yeah. and on a co-regulation agreement, a pattern like this works for us. So that's a big topic. We can come back and revisit it. Um, it's a topic near and dear to my heart because it's changed everything about how yeah. I am alive, let Me alone too. how I relate. So everybody go breathe and um, keep talking to each other. Thank you for listening to the Project Relationship Podcast with Dr. Jolie Hamilton and Ken Hamilton. If you're enjoying our conversation, we would be so grateful if you would drop a rating and quick review so more people will be able to find us. And if you have questions or suggestions that you of things you'd like us to tackle, please send an email to Jolie at JolieHamilton.com. I'd love to hear them. Project Relationship, the entrepreneur's action plan for passionate, sustainable love, is available on Amazon in Kindle, soft, or hardcover versions. This book is a succinct, practical guide to improving your love life. I wrote Project Relationship to give you a set of quick action tools and conversation guides that can transform a mediocre relationship into a fabulous one. These tools are based not just on what Jolie learned in her studies, but on what we actually do to make our relationship thrive. Until next time, remember, relationships can be messy, and that's good news.